All right, I'm delighted to be here. I'm Mike Jordan from Berkeley. Uh, delighted to honor someone who I consider a friend, and uh, from my point of view, the, the greatest AI researcher past and present. I think most of us here agree about that. Uh, I think there's no comparison. Um, um, uh, so uh, I'm going to the title. I hope has a little bit of referential that some of you will have caught. Um, so this is about expressive priors. Um, despite the great attempts of my colleague Stuart Russell to convince me that logic is the way to make expressive priors, I'm going to try to convince you something else is. Uh, now, I think most of us academics have two goals here at this meeting. One is to honor Yuta for his previous three books, uh, and the other is to try to convince him that his fourth book should be in our area. All right, so this is my area, so Yuta, pay attention. Uh, so I gave a previous, <clears throat> a previous presentation for Yuta when he got the Franklin Award at a different symposium, and that was more about honoring him for the past and embarrassing him and all. So this is more about the future. Okay, quick outline. Um, I'm gonna focus on something called document modeling for concreteness, but these are a class of models that are all kind of graphical models, but in infinite dimensional spaces. And I'm gonna try to convince you they're interesting, useful. This is about 10 years of research that are summarized in the chapter in the, uh, in the Pearl volume, and I'm gonna try to trot you through. Now, one quick antidote, which is that I, I, I don't remember when I first met Yuta, but I uh, first encountered him at a conference, I think, in the late 80s. Maybe it was the one in Irvine that was mentioned earlier. And I was sitting down looking through my book, and um, Yuta sat down near my head, it's Yuta Pearl. And um, he, there was someone else sitting there, and, and he proceeded for the next half hour to grill that person about what was, what was interesting late, lately in planning. And it was just great. This was not, the field I was in, people didn't do that. They sat down and tried to convince them that what they had done lately was great. But he just wanted to absorb like a sponge everything that had been done on some topic that the guy happened to be in planning. So, and all I know about planning came from that half hour. It was uh, <laughs> fantastic. So, uh, no, really, it, it, I remember it very well. It, it convinced me I should be in this field with someone like this. This is, you know, he's having fun and he's intellectually alive. This is where I want to be too. Um, okay, so let me start with finite mixture models. Um, these are called topic models in the document world. Um, if you don't know what a mixture model is, it's if you take the word uh, J-U-D-E-A, and you look at all the people in this room, how they pronounce it, there are many different modes of that distribution. And that's a mixture model. It's not a rough set, it's a mixture model. Um, all right, so these were used for uh, document. Uh, so what's a document model? I have a document's collection of words. I, I need a probability distribution on those words. If I just have one distribution, that, that's called a finite mixture model. I select among several choices for the document. And that was done about 20 years ago. And that gave kind of crummy document models. You could only have one topic in a document. The document could only be at one thing, so that's not very interesting. Uh, and so along, along came something called admixture models. Um, and so in this case, in a given document, you can have multiple topics. So the first thing you do when you generate a document is you, first of all, select one of the, the topics, the mixture components, and then you draw one word from that mixture component, and then you do that again. So you can get multiple topics appearing inside of a single document. Very simple idea. This is called admixture models. And this was the first thing, one of the things that I got involved in at Berkeley. So my group, we, we did something called latent inertial allocation. This is a very trivial graphical model. So I've drawn with plates, but if you expand that out, it's just a tree. All right, so we were past trees at this point, but this turned out to be our most popular graphical model ever. All right, so it generates documents as follows. Forget about the hyperparameters. You put a distribution on topics. Theta is a point in the simplex. The corners of the simplex are the topics. K topics, K points in the simplex. Then repeatedly, that's the innermost box, select one of those topics. Having selected the topic, you select a word from the distribution indexed by that topic. Do it again and again and get one document. Do it again and again and get a whole corpus. All right, that's LDA, trivial little model. It's called Dirichlet because this is a Dirichlet distribution with parameter alpha. Okay, so that's great. Well, there's some limitations that we've been working on in the last uh, 15 years. Um, so how many topics? Well, it's a really hard problem. And, and it's, more, it's more severe than in simple fix, mixture models because you have each document has its own number of topics. And so you want to kind of take a union over the entire set. That's kind of hard to think about as a model selection problem. Second problem, there's many problems. So here's two I want to focus on today. No notion of abstraction hierarchy. You generate a topic is just a distribution of words. No hierarchy, no structure, no good. All right, let's focus on the first problem, how many topics? So here's one way to approach this problem that I been, come, became fond of at some point called a Dirichlet process mixture model. I have three ways of presenting this on this slide. One with equations that the statisticians love, 
Um, one with little cartoons that my students love, and one for everybody else in this room. It's a graphical model. Now, this is a graphical model with one node that happens to have, an, it's, a, it's a measure valued node. It has infinite support. It's not a Gaussian, it's not a multinomial, it's some other object. And I'm going to tell you how you generate these kind of things, but just for now, this is some space. And these are atoms in the space, and they have a height. And these total heights sum to one. And there's a countable infinite number of these atoms. So it's an object called, a, it's a draw from an object called the Dirichlet process. It's a particular stochastic process. It has some hyperparameters. It has a base measure, and it has a, 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 a concentration parameter. Having gotten that object, an infinite valued object, you then repeatedly select one of those atoms with probability proportional to its height. Let's call that theta. So that's one of the atoms. And then you generate data from a distribution indexed by that parameter. So there's the math. So that's called a Dirichlet process mixture model. Um, OK, now you get clustering out of this model. And so I mean, maybe the, the picture is even better than the equation. So here's how clustering works. So theta, think about theta 1. It's one of these atoms with height chosen proportional to the, to the height. Theta 2 is also one of those atoms. What's the probability that theta 1 is the same as theta 2? Right? Uh, well, it turns out to be a half. <laughs> All right? And in general, uh, it's um, described by a process called the Chinese restaurant process. This is a, one of the first things I learned when I got to Berkeley, something called the Chinese restaurant process. And let me explain it to you. It has kind of a pearl-esque flavor of a little diagram with people moving, soldiers moving around or something. So here's a little Chinese restaurant in which Chinese soldiers come in. And the first soldier sits at this table with probability one. The next soldier joins them with probability half or starts a new table with probability half. And the general rule is you sit at a table proportional to the number of people already at the table. So preferential attachment sort of story. After n people have come in, you have log n occupied tables on average, and it's a random partition. Okay, so it, it leads to clustering. And the magical thing is that that little simple structure captures exactly what happens with the Dirichlet process as a stochastic process. So you go back to this page. If you first of all pick G once and freeze it, and then repeatedly draw from it and ask who's, who has the same atom as who else, it's described by the Chinese restaurant process. So kind of a magical bit of combinatorics takes an infinite object that I haven't told you yet how it's generated, but generated in a certain way. Infinite number of atoms collapses down to this little, simple, little kind of pearlesque kind of restaurant story. All right, that happens again and again. It's something called DeFinetti's theorem that makes this happen. Um, and I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm exploiting that in my research the last many years, and I, I hope you'll find this interesting. OK, so that's the Chinese restaurant. Um, if you want to now use this for a pro full probability mixture modeling, all you do, really simple, is that the first person to sit at a table draws a parameter some, from some prior on parameters, and everybody else who sits at that table inherits that parameter, and that parameter is like, is a, like a cluster. Um, so this might be a mean and, and, a, and a covariance matrix for a Gaussian, and all these guys are now drawn from a Gaussian cluster at some place in space, and a different cluster here, a different cluster here. So we have log n clusters. It grows as a function of n. It's not fixed. It's not a parametric distribution. It's growing. The number of parameters is growing at rate log n. So this is non-parametrics. Non-parametrics doesn't mean you have no parameters. It means you have a growing number of parameters. As n gets larger and larger and larger, you get more and more parameters. And the limit, you get an infinite number. And that picture of that Dirichlet process is the infinite bag you could eventually use if you were to have infinite amount of data. OK. All right, now, what if we tried to do that's been done for mixture models. That, that goes back about 20, 30 years. What if you try to do this for admixture models? All right? It fails completely. All right? So um, remember what an admixture model is. You have a single document, and it's now going to draw repeatedly topics and then draw words from those topics. All right? That's a whole little clustering model in and of itself. Every word can come one, from one of a number of topics. Right? There are several topics in a document. So each word comes in, that's a customer. And they're drawn from a topic, and maybe you get a brand new topic emerging. It looked, it looked like it was about travel, and suddenly there's a sports word. Ah, I better generate a sports word. And you keep on going. That's one whole document. It's a whole universe into itself. Now you go to another document over here. You do that whole thing again. You get a different Dirichlet process for that document. With probability one, there will be no overlap in the atoms. Right? You will get no overlap, Not, no Chinese restaurant anymore, no overlap at all. And so you can't do the Dirichlet process for admixture models. All right, so we solved that with an architecture called the hierarchical Dirichlet process. It turned out there was a solution to this, which is the classical statistician solution. You go to one more level up in the hierarchy. All right, so instead of drawing the Dirichlet process once um, and freezing that, you now draw it once, and then you use that as the base measure into in each of these Dirichlet processes. So this becomes a tree of Dirichlet processes that are all connected up, and Bayesian inference passes atoms around in the tree. 
All right, so now you start to get overlap between these atoms here and these atoms here and these atoms here, uh, just like you do in classical Bayesian hierarchies. And it has a Chinese restaurant story, too. If you integrate out all those atoms and ask who sits with who, there's a story, which is that here's group one, restaurant one, restaurant two, restaurant three. First person that comes in to this restaurant sits at this table with probability one. And then the first person at the table, they go get a dish from a buffet line, and they bring the dish down to the, to the table, and everybody who sits at the table eats that same dish, if you're the first person. Now, when you go up there, maybe you picked um, Kung Pao chicken. You put a little check mark next to Kung Pao chicken. And then someone else in some other restaurant, when they go to the buffet there, and they look at the number of check marks next to, the, to the, each of the dishes. And they pick a dish proportional number of check marks next to it. So you get preferential attachment among dishes. And those dishes then come down into the restaurants, and you get sharing among the restaurants. Right? So that's not just a cute little metaphor. That's what you get when you mathematically integrate out all those Dirichlet processes in a tree. OK, now, the underlying object, which I finally became familiar with, it was first discussed by a probabilist named Kingman in 67, um, but I have now learned about this, um, is something called a completely random measure. Now, let me look at my time. I'm supposed to do all of Don Bayesian on a pair of measures. I started at 5 after. I've got four minutes to do the rest of it, so I, I'm going to barely make it. I will make it. Um, so this is a divide and conquer idea. So we have a space we want to put measures on, and if you look at two disjoint subsets, I want to put a, an amount, a measure, which is independent on those two di disjoint subsets. If you have that independence property, then that's called a completely random measure. There are many examples. Um, here are some of them. The Dirichlet process is not because it has to integrate to one. If I put a lot of mass here, I have to put less mass here. There's a, there's a negative correlation. Um, so that's kind of a picture suggesting this on a one-dimensional space, but we want to use these on arbitrary parameter spaces, so omega should be thought of as a big space. Now, there's a general way of generating all completely random measures, a characterization theorem, which is that if you take your original space, omega here, and you cross it with the real axis, and you put a rate measure up above that of some kind, and then you treat that as the rate measure for a Poisson process, you now get a bunch of x's in the plane from that Poisson process, and you drop each x back down to the omega axis and erase the rest of the diagram. That object that you've got, now defined on omega, is a completely random measure because a Poisson process puts independent mass in different regions. So when you drop it down, it'll stay independent. And all completely random measures can be gotten this way. It's a very important, beautiful theorem. So in particular, something I'm very enamored of is the beta process, not the Dirichlet process. So the Dirichlet process gives you clustering. It gives you a bunch of atoms that sum to one. You then pick from them, and you get one atom. What if I want to get a bunch of coins that each have their own independent probability of being heads? So if I now sample from those, I get a few coins, and not just one coin that turn up one, heads, a bunch of zeros. Well, you can now define an object called the beta process. And so we, we've done this in a paper. Um, let me not get into the math. I wanted to have one equation, but there it is. That's the rate measure for the beta process. It looks like that. Um, it, it has a singularity at the origin. And most of the atoms you get are nearly zero, and a few of them are kind of non-zero. If you sample from that, you get mostly zeros and a few ones. So it's the Bayesian sparse infinite representation. You've heard a lot about sparsity. This is uh, a Bayesian's version of this. And there's a whole bestiary of these objects. Gamma processes, where you put the gamma measure instead of the beta measure. And Dirichlet processes can be cut by taking a gamma process and normalizing it. And that now explains how I got that diagram I showed you on that previous page. And then Bernoulli process is gotten by taking the beta process and sampling it, and so on and so forth. So you can build up all kinds of objects like this. This is a draw from a beta process. It's an infinite collection of coins. And if I draw repeatedly from that, I get Bernoulli processes, one, two, three, up to 100. And they mostly have all zeros, but a few ones. And you start to get ones co-occurring where people, you know, features. These are features emerging as customers come into this, to this restaurant. It turns out there is a restaurant analogy for this as well. If you integrate out the base beta process, you get something called the Indian buffet process, where people come into the restaurant, they pick a few dishes, and then some of the next person picks this, a few of the same dishes, and then a few more dishes, and so on. That's gotten by integrating out the beta process. OK. Um, I wanted to say I've got two minutes left. Uh, that, that, we, that was kind of a quick tour through, you know, if I had sat next down to you in a conference, this is what I would have done in 10 minutes. And um, that was a quick tour on, on Bayesian non parametrics. How do you deal with problems if you don't know the structure? And you want the structure to grow as you get more and more data. So that's kind of a toolbox for doing that. Quick. Now, this last little issue about abstraction hierarchies. So um, let me just show a picture. So we have a paper that just came out of JACM, which I, if you want to read one, this was written for computer scientists. 
Um, so the nested Chinese restaurant process is a whole collection of Chinese restaurants. There's a Chinese restaurant here, and here, and here, and here, and here. And now when you pick a table, that tells you what branch to go out. All right? And so now you can get an infinite tree, infinite branch and infinite tree. And so people tend to come in the restaurant and pick the same tables by the preferential attachment. And so some of these branches will have lots of people going down them. And you'll get subtrees that will have higher prob high probability. And so you can now build a document model based on that. Documents go down the tree, and then you generate words from along the paths. And now function words will want to percolate up to the top because they get used by all documents. These uh, word, uh, let more concrete words will go here, and still more concrete words go down here just because of usage patterns in the tree by the preferential attachment. All right, so we've done that on a bunch of domains. We call it hierarchical latent Dirichlet allocation. Um, and there's an example of a data analysis. All right, I'm, I'm going to arrive at the last slide here. All right, so now we had two ideas. Um, uh, the, the problem with the model I just showed you is that it ticks, a document is one path down the tree. We're back to a single topic model. It has an abstraction now uh, up and down the tree, but it can't allow you to go over multiple topics, multiple branches. So that's been broken for about five years now. And so if you um, read the paper that I have in the Perl thing, you will see something called the nested beta process, which does exactly this. It allows you to go, to go down multiple branches of the tree and then generate words all along that. I am now done, and I did finish on time. Um, so let me just summarize. This was uh, kind of the throw a bunch of ideas out there. Um, but there are a few themes. The main one is that these priors I've discussed are very expressive. I hope I've kind of conveyed a little bit of that. They have combinatorial properties. Logical properties, I don't know, but they have combinatorial properties. That allows them to fold up into these restaurants that yield efficient posterior inference. There are three ingredients that lie behind this, and I didn't talk at all about applications, but we've had a whole string of them, and um, you, can, you can get state-of-the-art results in a number of interesting domains using these ideas. Done. <laughs>